Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In parts one and two of our series on the Faceless Men, we drew parallels between the cave where Blood Raven and Bran are and the House of Black and White. Additionally, we discussed how the first Faceless Man took root amongst the slaves toiling in the mines beneath the Fourteen Flames and officially came to be after giving the gift of death to a slave that prayed for release from servitude. The first faceless man, with the assistance of the Moonsingers, led a slave uprising on a Valyrian slave fleet bound for Sothorios, and led the freed slaves to Bravos. The secret city, as it came to be known, hid beneath the heavy fogs for centuries before being discovered. We believe the first faceless man was a member of a race of children that dwelt in the caverns beneath the fourteen flames and decided to give the gift of death to the slaves in honor of their true god of death. We also highlighted the fact that Weirwood can be found on the door and within the House of Black and White, which led us to believe that under the House of Black and White stands a Weirwood tree and, according to legend, an entrance to the underworld. Coming up in this video, we are going to be discussing why we believe that the House of Black and White is where the most organized and sophisticated blood sacrifice in the world can be found, and how the religious tolerance practiced in Bravos, in actuality, more closely resembles the religious zealotry some of the other free cities were founded on as opposed to the true form of it that was practiced in Valyria. So, let's do this. As Arya learned, Bravos is a city made for secrets, and became the refuge for those seeking to escape the Dragonlords of Valyria. One of the hallmark characteristics of the Valyrian Freehold was religious tolerance, meaning anyone could believe in whatever god or gods they chose. For most, religious freedom was a welcome right, but there were those who argued against it, claiming that the Valyrians regarded all faiths as equally false and that allowing their citizens to keep a multiplicity of gods was a means to keep them divided to lessen the chances that they would unite under the banner of a single faith and overthrow them. The Valerians themselves claimed that religious tolerance was a means of keeping the peace in the lands of always summer, but inevitably those who found the tolerance of the freehold intolerable set out to establish cities of their own godly cities, where only the faith of those who founded it will be practiced. One such example is Lorath. Lorath, located on the northern coast of Essos, east of Bravos, was founded by a group of religious dissidents who worshipped Boash, the blind god. Rejecting all other deities, they ate no flesh, drank no wine, and walked barefoot through the world, clad only in hair shirts and hides. Their eunuch priests wore eyeless hoods in honor of their god, as only in darkness, they believed, would their third eye open, allowing them to see the higher truths of creation that lay concealed behind the world's illusions. Now, opening your third eye is something that we mentioned in one of our Blood Raven videos. We put forth the idea that the three-eyed crow, who is not Blood Raven, but actually an instrument of the Great Other, tends to visit those who are on the verge of death, and uses their natural will to live to convince them to make a deal with the devil, so to speak. For example, when Bran is in his coma, the three-eyed crow visits him while he is falling in his dream, and says to him, fly or die, but in order to fly, you have to open your third eye. In various cultures throughout history, 
The third eye is considered a portal through which demonic possession is possible. So, how does this relate to the faceless men? Well, Arya is blinded as part of her faceless men training, and as part of this ordeal, she had to dress like a beggar and go out about Bravos and come back each morning with three new things that she learned. On her last day as a begging blind girl, Arya went to a bar that had an owner generous enough to let her come inside and gave her something to eat and drink. And it was at this bar that Arya opened her third eye for the first time. The Lysini took the table nearest to the fire and spoke quietly over cups of black tar rum, keeping their voices low so no one could overhear. But she was no one, and she heard most every word. And for a time, it seemed that she could see them too, through the slitted yellow eyes of the tomcat purring in her lap. One was old and one was young. One had lost an ear. But all three had the white blonde hair and smooth fair skin of Lise, where the blood of the old freehold still ran strong. The next morning, when the kindly man asked her what three things she knew that she had not known before, she was ready. I know why the Sea Lord seized the good heart. She was carrying slaves, hundreds of slaves, women and children, roped together in her hold. I know where the slaves came from. They were wildlings from Westeros, from a place called Hardhome, an old ruined place, accursed. It is good to know. This is two. Is there a third? Yes. I know that you're the one who has been hitting me. Her stick flashed out and cracked against his fingers, sending his own stick clattering to the floor. The priest winced and snatched his hand back. And how could a blind girl know that? I saw you. I gave you three. I don't need to give you four. Maybe on the morrow she would tell him about the cat that had followed her home last night from Pinto's. The cat that was hiding in the rafters, looking down on them. Or maybe not. If he could have secrets, so could she. That evening, Uma served salt-crusted crabs for supper. When her cup was presented to her, the blind girl wrinkled her nose and drank it down in three long gulps. She gasped and dropped the cup. Her tongue was on fire, and when she gulped a cup of wine, the flame spread down her throat and up her nose. The wine will not help, and water will just fan the flames, the waif told her. Eat this. A heel of bread was pressed into her hand. The girl stuffed it in her mouth, chewed and swallowed. It helped. The second chunk helped more. And come the morning, when the night wolf left her and she opened her eyes, she saw a tallow candle burning where no candle had been the night before. Its uncertain flame was swaying back and forth like a whore at the happy port. She had never seen anything so beautiful. So it would appear that the real purpose of her training was to force Arya to open her third eye, and in doing so, she could see through the eyes of the cat. This is how she saw the Lysini in Pinto's bar, and the kindly man on her return to the temple. After informing the kindly man that she knows that it was he who was beating her every day with a stick, she was given a potion made by the waif to grant her back the use of her eyes, and having proved to them that she was capable of conscious skin changing as opposed to just having wolf dreams. The faceless men had now confirmed that she was not only powerful enough to take a face, but ready, and she was given her first new face the next time we see her. Another commonality between the followers of the blind god worshipped in Lorath and the faceless men is that both practice an extreme abnegation of self. The Larathi claimed that only by freeing themselves of human vanity could they hope to become one with the godhood. Accordingly, they put aside even their own names and spoke of themselves as a man or a woman, rather than say I or me or mine. This is likely one of the reasons why Jack and Hagar, who is Larathi, speaks the way he does. But more importantly, it is exactly the way in which the faceless men are instructing Arya to speak. For example, the kindly man refers to Arya as a girl, 
and continuously asks her who she is, which she's supposed to reply to by saying, no one. So it would appear that an abnegation of self is as important to the faceless men as it was to the Lorathi who worshipped the blind god. Kohor, also known as the City of Sorcerers, is the easternmost of the nine free cities, located in the largest forest in Essos. Kohor was colonized by worshippers of the Black Goat, who founded Kohor following a great religious schism. Maesters claim that the dark arts such as divination, blood magic, and necromancy are practiced there. The Black Goat is a grim deity that demands daily blood sacrifice. Animals, such as horses or calves, are most often what they sacrifice, but on holy days, condemned criminals go beneath the knives of the cowled priests, and in times of danger, it is said that the high nobles of the city offer up their own children to placate their bloodthirsty god, so he might defend their city. Now I feel we would be remiss if we didn't mention that the black goat of Kohor appears to be borrowed from H.P. Lovecraft's The Black Goat of the Forest. Except in our story, he substituted Kohor, which everyone thinks of as a city, for forest. There are way too many Lovecraft-inspired ideas to cover here, but we will be doing a video or two on the links that can be found between our story and Lovecraft lore in the near future. But for our purposes here, in Lovecraft's Out of the Aeons, he stated that the black goat was basically an idol through which the Shub Nagroth could be worshipped. The Shub Nagroth, according to Lovecraft, is an evil cloud-like entity who some claimed was another evil deity known as the Not-to-be-named one. I don't know about you, but this sounds very similar to when Melisandre refers to the Great Other as he who will not be named. As to its relevance here, within the House of Black and White stands an idol of the Black Goat, which seems to indicate that the Kohorik and the Faceless Men worship the same god, Death. Norvos is another free city that came into existence following this religious schism in Valyria. The sect that settled Norvos is as strange or stranger than the followers of the blind god Boash, or the Black Goat, and far more secretive. Even the name of their god is revealed only to initiates. That he is a stern deity cannot be doubted, for his priests wear hair shirts and untanned hides, and practice ritual flagellation as part of their worship and once initiated, they are forbidden to shave or cut their hair. Norvos is a theocracy, ruled by their bearded priests who claim that they are ruled by their god, who speaks commands to them from the depths of their fortress temple, which only true believers may enter and live to tell about it. Every part of life there is governed by their three bells that tell people when to wake, sleep, work, play, and even when they're allowed to have sex. Norvos is also said to be located amidst a vast series of caverns and surrounded by a dark forest. But let's get back to this god that speaks to the priests from the depths of their temple and the fact that no quote-unquote non-believer has ever entered this temple and lived. The fact that this god, who no one is allowed to know about, commands from the depths of the temple, seems to us that this temple must be similar to the House of Black and White, in that a large percentage of the temple is subterranean. The fact that they kill anyone who dares enter the temple to try and find out what goes on inside is a strong indicator that whatever it is they are doing in there is not something that the rest of the world would look kindly on. As a brief side note, it is not clear whether being a believer in this god necessarily makes you, as an individual, evil, as the Unsullied appear to be initiates, given that Grey Worm told Danny that the god they worship's name cannot be spoken to an outsider, 
and their obedience seems remarkably similar to that of the Norvoshi people. What does seem clear is that the Norvoshi believe in a god that requires total and complete submission, in turn stripping them of their free will and one would imagine much of their humanity. The Unsullied are said to be unafraid of death, which is a concept that most cannot understand. However, if you see death as a gift or as a means of becoming one with the godhood, you would have no reason to fear it and would most likely welcome it. So, Norvo's cohort and Lorath stand apart from the other free cities in that they were founded for religious reasons instead of trade. According to the World of Ice and Fire, Norvos and Kohor were founded following a religious schism, which seems to indicate that the groups who colonized these cities practiced the same religion or worshipped the same deity, but in different ways. In our world, this would compare to the differences between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. In addition to the reasons for which they were founded, it seems that all three worship a dark deity. Of the three, the one we are most uncertain about would be Lorath and their worshiping of the blind god. In one sense, it appears that they are a sinister group who honor their god by living in darkness in order to open their third eye which, as we said, has been historically considered a portal through which demonic possession is possible. Additionally, in our own histories, the blind god was considered a form of Satan who went by the name Samael. Samael was considered to be both good and evil, but in most accounts is linked with hell, destruction, and the underworld. However, in the world of ice and fire, it states that the worshippers of the blind god considered all forms of life as sacred and eternal, which makes us wonder whether they truly are as sinister as they appear, but rather just in search of a greater understanding of the mysteries surrounding the world's creation. Either way, of the three, they are the only ones that are no longer in existence, which implies that they were either killed off or migrated elsewhere and exist under a different name. But the point we are trying to make here is that the free cities of Norvos, Kohor, and Lorath were all founded by religious groups seeking to escape the freehold and their custom of religious tolerance. Bravos, on the other hand, appears to have been created with the same ideals as its sister cities but did so by creating the illusion of religious tolerance. Beneath the heavy fogs and illusions of tolerance, the Bravosi created a city where their one true God could be worshipped by all those who believed in it, regardless of their practices. In doing so, they paid each subgroup that came into existence following the schism their due, while terrifying everyone else into silence. Think about it. Who's going to publicly speak out against the faceless men and their many-faced god within Bravos, as they would have no way of knowing if one of them is standing right next to them? Now, at the beginning of this video, we expressed the belief that the House of Black and White is really the world's largest and most sophisticated blood sacrifice, that there is a weirwood deep below the temple, as well as the entrance to the cavern system that leads to the underworld. But how could a cavern system be connected to an island in the middle of a lagoon? Well, when Arya is taken down to the Hall of Faces, she went down 94 steps and noted that she had to be well beneath the canals of Bravos, which I would guess is accurate because 94 steps down has to take you somewhere in the general vicinity of 60 to 70 feet below the surface. She gets down there and enters the hall where a thousand faces look down on her, which seems to be an awfully small number considering that they collect a few new bodies every day or about a thousand per year for the past, I don't know, say a thousand years or so. That would mean that they should have hundreds of thousands, if not million faces. 
This leads us to believe that the numbers Jojen used to explain to Bran what the odds were that someone would be born with the ability to skin change, or about one in a thousand, also plays a role here. And only faces from people who were skin changers themselves can be worn by the faceless men. The other significant piece of information that we get from this sequence is that this is not the bottom level of the temple as Arya sees a tunnel leading from the hall that contains a winding staircase that goes even deeper, and she wonders, how many cellars are there? Do they just go down forever? That is a very good question. Now, given that they don't appear to use the faces of 999 out of a thousand people that come there to die, they must do something with them because they take the time to clean and prepare the bodies for some purpose. Their bones do appear to be used. As Arya described another tunnel leading from the Hall of Faces, that's walls are made of bones and are supported by columns made of human skulls. But what happens to the rest of the body? There is no mention of rotting bodies with or without heads or faces lying around. And there isn't exactly a cemetery out back, or a constant supply of dead bodies floating in the canals of Bravos. So they must have an internal means of disposing of about, I don't know, a thousand bodies a year for the last thousand years or so. This is where the blood sacrifice to the subterranean weirwood comes into play. They kill the people upstairs in the temple, and take the body and clean it which could be viewed as them purifying them for their god. The method used to kill them ensures that none of the blood is wasted. So once clean, the body is taken down to the deeper levels of the temple and given to the weirwood, thus turning the house of black and white into the largest and most sophisticated blood sacrifice in the world. Getting back to the caverns rumored to be the entrance to the underworld connecting to the House of Black and White. Arya makes note of the fact that the House of Black and White is a temple on an island with one door, yet the Faceless Men themselves seem to come and go without using the door. Given that they are surrounded by water, and Arya has yet to see the levels lower than the Hall of Faces, the only explanation for how they could come and go without using the door would be secret underground tunnels. But in order for them to function as passageways, and stay secret from everyone else in Bravos, they would have to be deep enough underground that they could pass below the waters of the lagoon, and most likely connect to the mainland, which is why we believe the Great Caverns thought to be the entrance to the underworld connect to the House of Black and White and were most likely created by the flow of the black death water that feeds the pool in the center of the temple. 